and welcome to another episode of Aloha Authentic with Kamaka Pili, Hawaii's only TV show where we feature our own local artisans, culture practitioners, kupuna, and community members around our islands to capture their story and capture the mo'olelo that they're trying to share with our people as well as around the world. So today, we're continuing on this role of talking with politicians and in that issue of politics. Today, we're very, very fortunate with a very busy lady around our islands, Andrea Tupola. Mahalo nui for Mahalo. taking the time. She's running for governor for this uh, upcoming race. So there's a lot of things that I know you want to share with the people and, and just, um, talk about. So Mahalo nui for allowing us to listen to your story. If you can just kind of just share a little bit about yourself and paint a picture for our audience and then of who you are and where you come from. Sure. Well, I was born in Kahuku at Kahuku Hospital and later we moved to Hawaii Kai. And so I was raised there. I went to public school up until the eighth grade and then I went to Kamehameha Schools. I was a song contest uh, director as well as I played basketball. I designed our class t-shirt. Um, I was really active. I've always been, um, as well as a musician, also an artist. My mother is a Parker. Mm -hmm. And so definitely a lot of our family members are artists. But I think for me, always being expressive in a very creative way has been part of my personality. Mm -hmm. I later went on to do college at Brigham Young University in the state of Utah. And during that time, I was elected student body vice president. I kind of got my feet wet with what it means to represent a body of people and be in charge. And then I did a mission for my church in Venezuela. I lived there for a year and a half and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about different governments, philosophies. I came back. I worked in L.A. I worked in Arizona. I worked in Utah. My husband played football in Texas and Michigan. Then we came home. Wow. So all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So we came home in 2008. I had my second child that year. I have two girls. They're nine and eight years old. They go to Kulakai Puni Waiyau. And I think for us, we wanted to move home so that our kids could learn more about the culture. My husband is full Tongan. I am half Samoan, quarter Hawaiian, quarter Portuguese, German, English, Scottish. So we really wanted our kids to be embedded in the culture with our family members. His parents live here. My parents live here. All of our brothers and sisters. So it was super important to us. I had no idea when I was moving home all of this was going to happen. <laughs> I thought I was going to move home, be a music teacher, live the dream, work at Kamehameha. I came home and I just, it was different. I taught song contests and for some reason I thought maybe I'm not supposed to teach at Kamehameha. I finished my master's degree in 2011 and I got a job at Leeward Community College. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching voice and choir and I loved it. That's what I wanted to be. Wow. Just a professor of music, just singing, making beautiful sounds. And then in 2012, I got a little bit more involved. And then in 2013, people said, oh, you should run for office. In 2014, I ran, I won my first time, got reelected in 2016, and now I'm running for governor. Yeah, I mean, so that was a lot that you, sh you yeah. shared and, and that you come from. What was those things other than people telling you to get into politics? What really urged you? to take that step and, and run? Um, I think for me, the, the biggest part was living out of the country. Um, I always talk about this part because it's, it's hard for people to grasp what we have here. Mm -hmm. You know, living in Venezuela where there's parts of the country with no water, where riots break out regularly, where people can carry guns wherever they go, where all the laws are suggestions, it really opens your eyes to what we have here, not only in the form of laws and freedoms and protections, but also in the form of just we have a desire to work, we go work. Mm -hmm. In Venezuela, that's not the case. The more you work, the more the government takes from you, they give to the poor. I mean, it is for where I was in 2003 to where Venezuela has come, that is the root of taking away that work ethic, that desire to succeed from a whole society, a whole country of people. And mm -hmm. so that I will never forget. And when I came back, I remember thinking like, all right, I need to get involved. I need to you know, help in my community. I need to be aware. I need to be serving other people. And so, yeah, I bought a house in 2010 in Waianae. Didn't know anybody in Waianae. Everyone's like, yeah, you should run for office. I was like, would that be PTA, AYSO? <laughs> I mean, what office are we talking about here? So, I mean, for me, it's just brand new. Yeah, so how was it about uh, living in the States, on the continent? What kind of experience and things that you oh. captured from there that you feel you brought back home? Well, you know, my first experience was in Utah, which is, you know, somewhat contiguous as far as like ethnic uh, backgrounds. But then I also lived in LA. So my mom is from Pasadena. I mm. taught school at a place called El Arca, which is for disabled Hispanic adults. And so I was immersed into this culture, this people that really needed, you know, that kind of help. I worked in Casa Grande, which is in, in between Tucson and um, Phoenix in mm. Arizona. This town is like, 
in the middle of nowhere and it was the only high school and I taught choir there so it really opened up my eyes to small populations of people that are really you know I guess underfunded you know very hard to come by resources but I loved it <laughs> I loved it I loved to live I mean I didn't know anyone I didn't know anyone in Arizona I just picked an apartment lived there by myself started to get to know the high school the kids that wow. and I brought all the kids from my choir to Hawaii and we performed in a competition here Wow! and we stayed at my mom and dad's house <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is you know local stuff <laughs> So, I mean, you, you talked about ethics, uh, eth the ethnic groups too that you come across. For you, being in that minority minority category, I guess when it comes to um, your ethnic background, being a Samoan in politics in Hawaii, how is that for you? What's well, the experience like? You know, I, I definitely think that. Polynesians in general, depending on what island nation you're from, your concept of politics is a little different, right? So in Tonga, they have a kingdom. And so some, you know, guys who come over here, they get involved, maybe not as much as maybe people who have come from a, a democratic background where they have elections mm -hmm. and you vote. So then in, in Samoa, there's two parts, right? So you have American Samoa government where people do get involved. You have the congresswoman right now who's a Mata Raid Wagon. Before that was Uncle Annie. So, you know, those kind of environments where people actively vote different because you know in western Samoa that's not the case which actually is now just called Samoa but I think that as a, a Samoan woman knowing that there's very few people in Hawaii that have kind of charted that course where they said yes I'm going to get involved and yes I'm going to try to get my people involved you know in here in Oahu I guess the example people always bring up is Mufi Hanneman one of the very few Samoans that was able to get to the position of mayor and so I think it's just a matter of charting the course my father was the first Samoan judge in the United States and so oh. I think for me it's it's knowing that it's okay to maybe be the first person mm -hmm. the pioneer maybe do you see any advantages or disadvantages of maybe the way that you were raised because you know ra being raised in a Polynesian lifestyle is much more different than if you know on the, on the continent from what I experience um I think for me, I'm pretty lucky because I have a very diverse background mm -hmm. so I can go to like a Fa Samoa and I can understand what's going on we go to church in Samoan and I can go to uh, you know a Tongan uh, dance and I can interact li with them but I think for some people who've only been in those situations it's hard to break out but because I lived in Hawaii Kai <laughs> <laughs> <Big advantage>. period <laughs> just I mean because it's it's not Polynesian over there you know mm -hmm. what I mean so it's not like I grew up with a bunch of Hawaiian neighbors or mm -hmm. so I think that opened my eyes to just knowing okay you might not always have people that look and talk like you but you can still understand people and get along and then as well living in the mainland or in areas of the continent I think for me it was just understanding that I can still be true to who I am but that I can increase the breadth of who I am by understanding other cultures and people. You'd be shocked to know mm. when I was in college, I was so against singing songs that were not Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> My teacher just said, oh, Andrea, you need to sing this Italian song, this German, and I was just like, oh no, I don't do that. <laughs> like, I don't sing opera, what are you talking about? And so it was super hard for me because I thought that I was gonna lose who I was if I started to embrace that. I was like, oh no, no, no. I come from, you know, Hawaii. We only sing songs like this. And it really took a lot for me. And then when I went to Venezuela, then when I learned how to speak Spanish and now Spanish, you know, I, it comes out of my mouth and I can interact in the culture. Then I realized you learn other culture languages or other cultural um, beliefs. You don't lose who you are. In fact, you become so much more embedded in who you are. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because for me personally, that was a, a big problem too. I was that, you know, I'm Hawaiian. That's, that's who I know I am. And that's what I became rooted in to step out of that and do something else. I had that fear like I, I just I don't know what the future holds. And I just fear that that may be something I would lose. I totally agree. Yeah. And, and we're young, right? So when I did that, I was 17, 18 years mm -hmm. old. I graduated when I was 17 years old. I remember thinking like no one taught me this mm -hmm. no one taught me when I go into another area with lots of different ethnicities what to do with myself how do I still be true to being Hawaiian or being Samoan when I have Native Americans African Americans Mexicans and and you know of course you develop that pride right mm -hmm. oh we're from Hawaii but then at the same time you get a little bit scared about embracing other types because you think oh no if I learn too much about that I'm not learning about myself my mm -hmm. people so it's kind of a I think for me the most important part about bringing my kids back here mm -hmm. 
I mean, from birth to whenever they go to college, I'm trying to embed them with who they are, where they come from, who, what their mo'ukwao, how is, who their genealogy is. And my kids ask me all the time, oh, is that auntie so-and-so? Okay, so who, who, how is she related? Mom's side, dad's side? And I want them to know that because if they do go away, I don't want them to be insecure in who they are and then mm -hmm. ask questions later on like, wait, should I be proud of this? Of course you should. Mm -hmm. Be proud of every part of who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that I think is a good segue into today, especially for the, the younger generation kids that are that see. You know, we had the 125th anniversary of Queen Liliuokalani's right. overthrow and and the Kingdom of Hawaii being overthrown, and this this renaissance of a renaissance era happening. Um, what is your opinion about that, especially for the kids that maybe are? taking what they know and more of a hearsay rather than really being educated and learning for themselves and then making their own personal opinions about that. What do you, you what would your mana'o be on moving forward as a state of Hawaii versus sovereignty? Well, I think in my mind I've always thought about progress as opposed to protest. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that protesting is important. In fact, I actually like it a little bit. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't, <laughs> right? Who doesn't like to rise up? Um, I think I like that part of it, but you know, in the past, especially with issues on Mauna Kea and different you know, Native Hawaiian issues that come up, my thing is that we should always have a clear strategy of where we're going. Mm -hmm. So you can protest what's going on, but then articulate a strategy, call out who's the leader, and start moving. Because I think as we start to solidify and decide, okay, we're gonna stand firm in our beliefs in it, but we're not gonna move, then generations pass by and there's still not a plan. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. You know, because I see some of the kids taking cues from some of the Hawaiians that are in leadership now, not just in political office, but just in the mm -hmm. community. And I always ask these children, you need to know for yourself why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So do it passionately. Like, I'm fine with anybody who has any belief, but be passionate about it and know why you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that's what I don't want the youth of our, this next generation to do is be blind sheep. Yeah. Know our history. Know where we came from. Know this oppression is affected, you know, our people. But then study what happened in other countries and other generations and see how these people ro rose up. Part of rising up is revitalizing your language. And look... Mm -hmm. Look where we are with the Hawaiian language and the revitalization. This year, we act I actually passed a resolution about using the correct Hawaiian names for places. All right. Right? <laughs> with the correct spelling. Okinas and Kahakos included. But, I mean, I bring up stuff like that because that, for a lot of people, I bring up Australia as one because they have lots of indigenous groups that are, you know, not mainstream. Yeah. Very small populations that actually got killed off. Yeah. But a lot of it happened when they revitalized their language and then their arts and then their culture. I know in Kauai they told me that they had like the fire, um, when they throw the, the flames from up on the mountain, it's okay. in Limahuli, which is the north side, Haena of Kauai. But two or three years ago, uh, Kavika Winters told me they started the tradition again. And this is shortly after the Hokula'a. Oh. And no one has done it for decades. Never heard of that. Yeah, so they had thrown it from the very top parts of it and basically you could see it. It was almost like Hawaiian fireworks. Mm -hmm. But um, cool. it's one of the things that I think people have seen with the Hokula revitalization, Olala Hawaii revitalization. Mm -hmm. We have the 125th is that, you know, and the year of the Hawaiian as, mm -hmm. you know, the administration says, we need to start to chart a course for the future of our people. Mm -hmm. You know, you shared a lot about being involved and, and participate in a lot of arts, arts and culture, not just here, but around the world too, teaching music, singing music, directing music. What is your opinion on the culture and arts within our communities? as it's proven history shows that, especially budget cuts or whatever, that in the, in the school and education system, it's always culture and arts is the first things to go. But in a Polynesian sense, culture and arts is very important as that's kind of part of the, the way of taking those footsteps into the future. What is your opinion about that and, and maybe the, the increase or the continue uh, taking away of those things from our keiki? I think that the culture and arts is everything. Uh, obviously, I'm biased. I'm a music <laughs> teacher. <laughs> I, I'm all about singing, playing instruments. And actually, two weeks ago, I did our second annual ukulele bash. So every year on the west side, I host it for the kids because we have various ukulele 
classes, but you know, we don't have a performing arts center. Mm -hmm. We they have a ukulele festival, but it's in Waikiki. Mm -hmm. You know, we want one on the west side where a lot of the Hawaiian musicians come out of. A lot of the kids are getting used to this this instrument. So for me, it was not just fighting for the funding in programs, but also seeing okay, what can we do as a community? Mm -hmm. Because in community settings, which we just unveiled the new Nanakuli Library, mm -hmm. in the front of the library, there's actually an amphitheater where you can have performances there. The grass, it's a free venue. So I think making sure that a lot of these programs exist within our communities because oh, the government here and there, here and yeah. there, you can't control it. But your community, you can actually build in programs that'll last generations. What do you? How do you see that benefiting? You know, for those who say uh, culture and arts, it needs to be the first one because math, science, all that other thing is more Ooh, important. Oh boy! Do we have enough time? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! I have too much opinion about that. You know, because they say the word STEM, we use the mm -hmm. word STEAM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you got to add the arts in there. Can't forget it. But you know, you think about for me the community because my whole drive is being community minded mm -hmm. in a place like white and i where we have populations of native flies that live in homestead where we have a huge population of polynesians samoans tongans all kinds out there what then would be appropriate for that population of people well guess what it's probably not going to be the same for kamuki mm -hmm. and that's okay but maybe that's what's gonna help our kids succeed. Maybe the arts programs are what's gonna save our kids. Maybe our kids who are truants need something like that so that they feel a sense of belonging. They, they feel like there's a kumo or somebody that's watching over them, mentoring them, creating them into the, you know, the person they need to become. I'm not saying this is gonna work everywhere. And that's my thing about statewide policy is, please bear in mind that communities are unique and that we should treat them as such. Mm -hmm. And that we should make sure that these art programs are in places where we know that it thrives. My kids, you know, go to school in Pearl City, but their performing arts are very different from our side. No. You know, they violin, <laughs> band <laughs> instruments, nothing wrong, I play the flute. <laughs> I was in band, um, but it's a different type of arts, you know, not everybody's rocking out on the ukulele. Maybe some people are, but maybe some people would prefer, you know, stringed instruments. So my thing is that art should be embraced in every form. And then in communities where they have natural fits, you should make sure to accentuate those communities where there's natural, uh, I don't know, community of artists. In Lanai, it's like that. I've met some of the artists that are there. So I think bringing out those strengths of the community to add to what's going on in the public school system, that's the, I think, the ultimate situation we want to be in. Awesome. Steam. I like that. Never heard of that before. Steam. But I'm going to keep, I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to that one. <laughs> um, okay, getting a little bit more into the politics side, and this is kind of, you know, to kind of step into it. I still don't really understand the difference between Democrats and Republicans. So in your point of view, what is the difference between the two? Um, I think when uh, both parties were originally created, the whole point was to be for the people, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when it was first started in the United States, Republicans ended up representing the Republic, you know, so and that's what it was. Later on, unions were made to represent people, meaning groups and factions of people that were working in factories, that were working in the fields. How are they going to get representation? How are they going to have a voice? Well, mm -hmm. The union came up and said, I'll be your voice because you're just one and two people, but we can be 500 people and then we can take these guys down. So this is the idea, right, is that there possibly could be a voice for the people, a voice for businesses and plantation owners. And some people, depending on what generation or what you know time period you lived in, you have some strong feelings about that. My mom and dad have some strong feelings about being Democrat, and they are, you know, and that's fine. They grew up in a different place. My mom grew up in L.A. My mm -hmm. dad grew up in Okinawa, Louisiana, Texas. He grew up oh. during segregation, and he's Samoan. So he got, you know, put into a category because there was no Samoan category. Mm -hmm. So later, you know, we see here now my whole thing is that these mindsets of partisan is almost gone for people of our generation because we don't think in partisan terms. We think that perhaps like a Republican value such as Constitution, maybe supporting it, or maybe First Amendment rights, or maybe religious freedoms. You know, maybe for a person, those are the things that they feel like resonate with them and that's why they decide to run as a Republican. Maybe for a Democrat, they're like, I wanna work for the people, I wanna make sure that the people have voice, maybe that's their passion. But at the end of the day, well, for me, it's always about the people who I represent. So I can put these things aside and say, this is who I am. This is how I've decided the values in my life, my background. But at the end of the day, I represent you and I work for the people. It's kind of a concept what Stephen Covey calls the third alternative. The third alternative means that you don't think in win-lose. You think in win-win. That there could always be a way forward no matter what background differences we have.
that's kind of where I come from. So I'm not of, you know, that generation where this big divide happened. I am coming from a generation of new mindsets that I feel like I ran as a Republican because I believed in parts of the platform, but that makes up who I am. However, when I go to the community, my main concern is making it less about me, more about them. And that means to listen and to take into consideration that everyone's background is very different. Mm -hmm. And you need to chart a win-win course forward in whatever you do. That, I, I mentioned that person as a personal question because one, I really didn't understand the difference. Two is when you watch all the news going on now, there's a definite division between the two. And for me, being a youngster trying to grow up in, and wanting to be inspired, I, I don't know wh who to follow because as much as we're supposed to be together as one people, there's bashing going on on both sides. And it's like, you know, I have a hard time. To, I don't know what to think now because nobody's making it very clear that they're working together as one. And I think this newer um, generations of politicians such as yourself is bringing a more unified approach, which I'm very appreciative because yeah, it's very, there's a very clear division between the two that makes it hard to want to believe in one or the other. And I think that's the issue with politics, at least in in the stance or, or the audience section that I'm coming from, is I have no idea what to think anymore because it's just so confusing and there's no aloha. I guess the, the negative comes out much more than the positive messages or, or at least vibrate a lot thicker. So mahalo for at least you know giving that kind of a clear platform uh, or message. For you, with the current politics within the country or especially Hawaii, what are you, do you think is the issues that's going on and how do you, what do you do or what is your approach to, to fix those issues? Well, you know, in our state, we're battling this huge influx of people leaving, right? Mm -hmm. So we have unaffordable houses, we have a huge houseless epidemic, we have the cost of living rising every day, you know, for various reasons. Some mm -hmm. of them is because the legislature keeps passing bills that are not business friendly. Mm -hmm. But I bring that up because I think one of the, the issues that people talk about that maybe it's hard to kind of put your finger on is what needs to change in order for us to preserve Hawaii, you know, in order for us to make it where locals can live here, where families can thrive, where generations of locals can stay here and not migrate to other places because it's easier, cheaper. And so I think that's been on the forefront of my mind as one of the main things that we have to talk about. Obviously having the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, which has almost 40,000 people on the list. Last year, no homes were built. Wow. $14 million was allocated to the department. So, I mean, it's just one of those things where you watch and you just kind of hurt on the inside because there's no way there's no way we can't help Hawaiians get onto Hawaiian homeland because we have a lot of land. That's mm -hmm. not the case. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of land out there. And the case is not where, oh, well, we're out of money. No, it's because, you know, the priorities were misallocated and the interpretation of the Hawaiian Homes Act. The vision of what Prince Kuhio saw, which was not just building homes, it would, talks about the wellness of the Hawaiian people. That means not just the house, but the infrastructure, the farming land, the farming equipment, the ability to actually grow your own food and sustain yourself in Hawaii, mm -hmm. not have to depend on out, you know, mainland goods to sustain your family. So I think for me, that's like the main issue that runs through my mind. And of course, with the houses, I feel like it's just, it's different on every island. Mm -hmm. But the government keeps trying to prescribe this one size fits all solution, which that's that's just not the case I've yeah. walked through encampments I've actually broken some down and I've actually helped some depending on what's going on because every encampment is different some of them are drug ridden some of them actually have children in it some of them actually want to progress into housing and so I feel like like what I said about communities every houseless individual is going through something there's about what 7,000 was the count last year mm -hmm. for for houseless individuals so how do we come at this problem well I think you have to come at the problem by deciding that whatever you think about it is wrong. Mm -hmm. Stop yourself, like just stop yourself, start to go and see the people for who they are. Don't make any assumptions like hey, everybody's a drug addict or everybody. no. Walk amongst these people, go inside these encampments and then determine for yourself what you think step one is. Mm -hmm. And then walk in the shoes of people who have been doing this for decades in these populations 
ask them for their input and then come up with solutions that are community minded where all the community members whether business whether nonprofit whether schools are all part of the solution maybe it's an encampment that has a school within it oh, I don't know maybe it's an encampment that has a, a clinic within it that has health care services there's a lot of things that we haven't considered because we keep thinking one way we need to understand that the problems we have cannot be solved in the mindset in which they were created. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, the conversation was just getting awesome, but before we, you know, time, time flew by. Um, and I wanna just, you shared a lot, you shared a lot when it comes to aloha. You know, everything that you said, it, it's much more in that feeling that I get from you. Um, but with that, with everything you've experienced, you've lived around the world, you've experienced a lot um, and dealing with, politics, which I was told, is something that could take away your aloha. And that being said, what would be your answer to what is aloha and how does that apply with you and in, in politics? Well, I think first off, it's a little uncomfortable for me to say that word because I, I refer to myself as a public servant. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a music teacher, I would say that I know very little about politics. I mean, yes, I am an elected official, but in my mind, I've always wanted to serve the community. I've always wanted to be a voice for them, which you know may or may not be poli politicky, but it's something that I feel like is at the heart and the core of who I am is just service. So I would say that, and I would say for me, aloha means that you can embody that in everything you do. So if, if I say that I wanna serve my community, then I realize that this doesn't mean eight to five, Monday through Friday. This means all the time, anytime. If I see something which I see a lot of things in my community when I drive, and I want to pull over and I want to get be helpful. I've directed traffic. <laughs> I've uh, picked up trash. I've hauled abandoned cars off the roads. I've been where they break down encampments. I've walked in, worked with the people, tried to get them into places that they need to be. I've, you know, not just spoken at schools, but I've helped to inspire some of their programs, like the PE program, got them uniforms, shoes, repainted their locker rooms, and all of that because for me. Whatever the government is doing is not enough. So what can I do on my behalf and express my aloha for these people? Well, I'm creative. So a lot of my solutions, you know, maybe politicians don't like it. I painted a mural on the supermarket <laughs> wall, 40,000 square foot mural, why and I? But hey, the wall was getting vandalized. For me, that was the best solution, paint something beautiful. So I think I I'm a different thinker and, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. And I show my aloha in a way that the people of White and I have appreciated because I am true to who I am, which is a non-politician, a mom, a community member that just wants to make a difference. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking the time in and sharing your message. To catch up with any past episodes, if you haven't yet, make sure you get to alohaauthentic.org as we have a plethora of mo'olelo for you to, to listen to as well as catching other perspectives of what that word aloha means. Um, if people want to find out more information f about you, where could they go to? Uh, votetopola.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at votetopola or Facebook, Andrea Tupola for governor. Right on. And remember, every Thursday morning at 8.40 on KHON, we have our weekly segment of Aloha Authentic going around our islands to share the mo'olelo of the streets that lie right beneath our feet. Hey, <laughs> tag that one. TM that. I just made that one up. That rhymed. Um, so make sure you catch that. And again, every episode airs every Friday at 6.30 on Olelo Channel 53. Replays itself on Saturdays at 10.30 on the same channel. And until next time, Aloha. Ahui ho. <laughs>